without further ado, we are going to start with Tony's presentation. Tony is the um, Clinical Trials Referral Coordinator at the Mayo Clinic. Give me one second. Um, and she's going to be our guest host for this webinar. Um, you're going to learn about the different types of clinical research and what to consider before becoming involved in research, which sounds like is what a lot of you are looking to find out about. Um, so Tony is going to start her presentation now. I can see she's just getting it queued up there. And um, without further ado, Tony, do you want to take it away? Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share this information. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm the Clinical Trials Refer Referral Coordinator for the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. So as I present information, I'm going to provide details on opportunities to participate in research, which would be for all diseases. But some of the examples that I may share tend to be cancer-related because I'm more familiar with cancer studies in, at Mayo Clinic. So um, this presentation is titled, Let's Talk About Clinical Research. And we've been teaching a class for probably a little over five years at Mayo Clinic just to offer some information on clinical research. And it's important that if you have questions about the content of this program that you, we encourage you to talk with your healthcare provider. So, Let's start out with a definition of what is clinical research. And as this slide shows, it says that it's a process to find new and better ways to understand, detect, control, and treat health conditions. And the scientific method is used to find answers to difficult health-related questions. Currently at Mayo Clinic, we have over 8,000 studies that are underway. Out of those, 900 are cancer-related. And in my day-to-day -day work, I talk with people that contact Mayo Clinic from all around the world wanting to know about the latest cancer research. And the nice thing with Mayo Clinic research is that we have partnerships in place, not only throughout the United States, but also globally. So our research, you may be able to access anywhere around the world. And that's where we're here to provide assistance with information. So again, we started out with a definition of what is clinical research. And there's many different ways to participate. You can volunteer to research, or volunteer to be a research participant, you can give permission to have your medical records reviewed. And sometimes you may get a letter um, asking for permission, um, for your permission to grant access to your medical records. Lots of studies that are done are, involve a chart review, and it's very easy to participate in medical, record, um, in medical research by allowing your medical records to be reviewed. You can also give permission to have your blood or tissue samples used for research. Sometimes when a patient has blood collected and there's a little bit of remaining blood, you could give permission for that blood to be used in research studies. So many different ways to participate in research. There's different types of clinical research. In prevention studies, those are clinical trials that look at ways to stop diseases from occurring or from reoccurring after successful treatment. And just for example, uh, current prevention studies that we have underway within the cancer center or we have a breast and ovarian cancer vaccine that is designed for after patients have had their initial treatment, the vaccine is given to possibly uh, prevent recurrence of the disease. So for prevention studies, you could have a vaccine that's being used, or maybe you're using a different um, a medication that can help prevent a disease from ever occurring or from reoccurring. There's different... Um, screening studies that are underway, and they compare detection methods for common conditions. Diagnostic studies are another type of clinical research. And in diagnostic studies, they test methods for early identification of disease in those with symptoms. Probably the most common type of clinical research would be treatment studies. And in treatment studies, they're testing maybe a new combination of drugs, new approaches to surgery, radiation, therapy, or even complementary medicine. The, the fifth type of studies that we have listed here are genetic studies. Genetic studies can be individual studies that are done, or they could be a part of other types of clinical research that's underway. Another type of clinical research is symptom management studies. Sometimes you hear those referred to as quality of life. And quality of life studies look at maybe uh, treatment is being recommended for a patient, and you're wondering how that's going to impact their sleep or what kind of side effects they may have, um, be it fatigue, nausea. And so there's lots of symptom management or quality of life studies that are underway. 
Another way of participating in clinical research, as I mentioned, is giving permission to have your medical records reviewed. So lots of opportunities for participating in clinical research, and there needs to be more awareness of clinical research being an opportunity. Um, just within the cancer um, community, it's estimated that about maybe 3% of adults participate in cancer clinical trials. But for children with cancer, there's between 80 to 90% of children participate in clinical trials. So definitely within the cancer community and then even for all different research as a whole, we need more awareness, which is what this webinar is offering. Clinical research volunteers can be healthy individuals, those um, individuals that have no current diseases or health conditions. Um, you could be a person that's at high risk for a disease or illness, or you could be already diagnosed with a disease or illness to participate. So lots of opportunities to get involved in research. When someone participates in research, you'll hear different terms, and sometimes they're used interchangeably. You could hear research study, experiment, medical research, or clinical trials. Clinical trials is more a subset of clinical research, but again, within the cancer community, that's probably a more common phrase that's thrown around as clinical trials. So what are clinical trials? Clinical trials are testing new therapies. And again, I, um, you could try a new way of using known treatments. Clinical trials, they take places in phases. And for a treatment to become standard, it usually goes through two or three clinical trial phases. The earlier phases, they look at the treatment safety, and later phases continue to look at safety and also determine the effectiveness of the treatment. So typically, when you have a clinical trial that's underway, there would have been six to seven years of laboratory research that would have gone on before a clinical trial begins. When clinical trials start out, they start out as a phase one clinical trial. In phase one clinical trials, the goal of those are to determine a safe dosage or to select the best way to give a treatment. Sometimes you'll hear phase one clinical trials referred to as dosing studies because they're trying to establish a dose of the treatment. And again, trying to figure out a best way to give a treatment. And those are smaller studies. If there's some type of positive activity that, that is seen in the phase one clinical trial, it can move forward to a phase two clinical trial. In a phase two clinical trial, they're looking at how effective is that treatment. And then the, a special focus of phase two is to monitor side effects. Side effects are looked at in all the phases of clinical trials, but it's a special focus of phase two. In phase three clinical trials, you're comparing the new treatment to the standard treatment. Sometimes you'll hear those referred to as randomized studies. And since, again, we, we mentioned that it's about 12 to 14 years of going through um, the approval for medications to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Six to seven years of laboratory testing, and then it's about, on average, about seven to eight years in clinical trials. So it's seven to eight years of going from phase one to phase two to phase three. Phase three is right before the Food and Drug Administration approves the treatment to be used. And sometimes you could have um, some results in a phase two study that, um, that the sponsor of that study may ask for an expedited review and approval through the Food and Drug Administration. I haven't seen it too often, but it does happen. So on average, uh, clinical trials go through about two or three different phases before the Food and Drug Administration approves the treatment to be used. After phase three, you can have phase four clinical trials that are being conducted. And those are very large studies to where they're going to look for some um, side effect, additional safety and effectiveness information and looking at additional side effect details. So who sponsors clinical research? And for the research studies that I work with, Mayo Clinic sponsors a lot of the research. You can have the National Institutes of Health, which um, includes the National Cancer Institute sponsoring research. The National Institutes of Health or the National Cancer Institute, they sometimes um, sponsor research through what's known as cooperative groups. And cooperative groups are many different um, medical centers or physicians that are working together on research. And the benefit of having research sponsored by cooperative groups is that maybe the research study 
would be available closer to a patient's home so that they don't have to travel. So again, Mayo Clinic sponsors clinical research, the National Institutes of Health or National Cancer Institute. You can have device or pharmaceutical companies sponsoring research or different foundations and organizations that are sponsoring research. And we've even had individual patients that have talked with our physicians and said, if, if I um, help you uh, raise some money, will you uh, conduct research? And so we have, again, many, many studies underway at this time. There's a saying um, of Dr. Hugh Smith, who used to be the head of Mayo Clinic, Board of Governors. And the saying is that at Mayo Clinic, our commitment to research is based on our knowledge that medicine must be constantly moving forward, that we need to continue our efforts to better understand disease and bring the latest medical knowledge to our practice and to our patients. And this fits with a phrase that is heard around the country and it's translational research. And it's how do we take the information that we're learning in the laboratory and bring it to the patients that we're seeing in the clinical setting? And then how do we take the information that we're learning in the clinical setting and take that back to the laboratory and learn more about that disease? So translational research is, is a phrase that you'll hear a lot nowadays. When research is being conducted, there's always oversight of that research. And at Mayo Clinic, we have something that's called an institutional review board. And that is not unique for Mayo Clinic. Um, if anybody is going to conduct research, there'll be oversight at an institutional review board. And you'll have probably multiple specialty committees and different colleagues that are reviewing that research. But overall, it'd be an institutional review board that is um, monitoring that research being conducted at a certain center. An institutional review board, they review proposals. And their goal is to protect the welfare and safety of human subjects. When someone participates in research, there's something that's known as a consent process. And in the consent process, you learn key facts about the study prior to and throughout your participation. It's important to know that participating in research is voluntary, that you have the right to withdraw at any time, and when something that's called a consent form is presented to a participant, that is an information document. It is not a contract. When someone participates in research, the study staff will describe the activities that will be involved. And studies may involve x-rays, blood tests, counseling, or medication. A study, when it's being designed, some of the phrases that you may hear are randomized to where it could be a computer that is assigning a participant to a certain group. It could be a blinded study where it's single blinded and the participant does not know what treatment or what um, intervention they're receiving. It could be a double blinded study to where neither the participant or the medical staff know um, what treatment or intervention the participant is receiving. There are safety um, procedures that are put into the protocol that if a patient would um, end up in the emergency room and there was a need to find out what kind of treatment or intervention the participant was receiving, there are ways to unblind that study. Lots of times I get asked questions about the use of placebos in clinical trials. And for cancer studies, it's very rare that placebos are used for treatment studies. Um, It'd be if there isn't a standard treatment for that type of disease, or if um, maybe one group of participants is getting the standard treatment, which involves two medications. Another group would get that, those same two medications and that third drug, which is probably the one that's being studied. So you may see a um, study that's designed where you get two drugs and a placebo, and then another group gets those same two drugs, and then the third drug, which is what's actually being studied. So placebo use in um, treatment trials is very rare, again, unless there isn't a standard treatment for that type of disease. Um, placebos, you may see them more commonly being used in symptom management research, like um, studies for fatigue or nausea, um, or maybe hot flash studies. Um, sometimes you'll have a single site study to where it's occurring just at one location, or you could have multi-site studies. And again, those tend to be 
um, like your cooperative group studies, or maybe it's a pharmaceutical company that has many sites that are participating. Not only um, will you find those studies going on in the United States, but they may be global studies that are underway. A phrase that you may hear is remuneration. And when you're looking at a consent form and you're, you're weighing out participating in a study, if you see the phrase remuneration, you're going to be paid for your time and inconvenience in participating. Lots of times for cancer clinical trials, um, there's a myth out there that patients are going to get free care when they participate in studies. But when you participate, you'll, you may hear a phrase, it's routine care cost. And again, these are I tailor this more towards cancer, but um, there's a phrase of routine care cost. So anything that is routinely done to care for that disease um, would be the patient or insurance company responsibility. So it's very important that if you're considering participating in a study, that you're communicating with the research team, that you check with your insurance company on if those routine care costs would be covered. Medicare has been covering those routine care costs since the year uh, 2000. And when Medicare started covering routine care costs of participating in clinical trials, a lot of state Medicaid programs came on board and started covering those costs. Um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, um, the health care reform, in 2014, there'll be national um, requirements of those routine care costs being covered. So again, it's very important that you're checking with your insurance company or if you are on Medicare or Medicaid, that you are, um, there's some very um, nice information that's out on um, the National Cancer Institute website, cancer.gov, and you can pull up information on Medicare coverage or um, what states cover uh, those routine care costs. So again, um, many states, I think there's about 34 or 35 states that have laws addressing clinical trial coverage. There's benefits to participating in clinical research. It can give you earlier access to new approaches. You could have regular visits with a research team. And another benefit can be the results may help others in the future. And just an example of this is I had a woman that came into um, the education center where I'm based, and she was being treated, with, treated for ovarian cancer. And her mom had been in a phase one clinical trial 10 years earlier for ovarian cancer. And she, the daughter was now receiving that uh, treatment that uh, the mom had in the phase one study, and it was now the standard treatment. And the daughter's comment was that that was the last gift that her mom had given to the family by participating in clinical research. But the, mo the mom's participation wasn't only benefiting the daughter, it was benefiting many other patients. So again, the results can help others in the future. But it's also important to look not only at the benefits, but at the risks or the inconveniences. Sometimes there can be more side effects. Sometimes that treatment or intervention, it may not be better than the standard treatment that's already been approved. And it's possible that additional visits or maybe some additional tests would be required when you participate in research. So it's very important that you know, well, especially for cancer, you know what your treatment options are. Clinical trials is just an additional thing to consider. And if you're, you're trying to decide on a treatment option or a clinical trial, just knowing what the pros and cons are and weighing out the risks and the benefits can be very helpful. So weigh your risks and benefits. And then again, just very important to keep at the forefront of your mind is that you can stop participation in a study at any time. It's voluntary. We encourage people to ask questions when they're considering participating in research or when they're already involved in a research study. And the saying is that write down the questions that you want answered. If you don't understand something, say so. And if you have concerns, speak up. There are a couple of websites that I'd like to um, highlight. The first website is the Mayo Clinic website and it's clinicaltrials.mayo.edu. And there isn't a www in front of that. And that is a way of finding out what clinical trials Mayo Clinic currently has underway. Another website is from the National Institutes of Health and it's clinicaltrials.gov. And that is a website that is probably the most thorough listing of clinical trials underway all around the world. 
And one of the additional benefits of finding clinical trials on the clinicaltrials.gov website is if you've participated in a research study in the past, or if you're wondering about any results from research studies, it's possible that those publications will be included for the research that is being um, listed on the clinicaltrials.gov. So those are a couple websites um, that I use every day and have been very helpful. And I'm glad to answer any questions and help you with um, any um, resources that you may be interested in. Okay, thank you so much, Tony. Um, that was really informative. So as she said, if you do want to start typing in some questions, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them. In the meantime, just in case you have any media meds related questions, I'm just going to quickly give you my um, email address. So I'm Elizabeth Messenger. And any media meds um, specific questions, you can email them to elizabeth at mediameds.org. Um, Tony, I don't know if you have any contact information you can share with them in case they have some questions or they want a copy of the slides, maybe. Absolutely, yes. If, if anybody out there is looking for similar information, glad to share these resources with you. Um, my email address, I've got such a tough last name. It's M-A-N-G-S-K-A-U dot T-O-N-I at Mayo dot E-D-U. And glad to help anyone out with information. Mm -hmm.